To navigate life, we need wisdom. Uh, without wisdom, nothing in life really matters. Nothing really has a point. And life can actually end up in destruction and as our life falls apart without true wisdom. But where does true wisdom come from? What does true wisdom look like in our life? In this series, Pursuing the Path of Wisdom, we look at the book of Proverbs, where God tells us exactly what true wisdom is, where true wisdom comes from, and what it looks like in our life. As you listen to this series, uh, if it impacts your life, like it, share it, and subscribe to our list so that you get more of these messages to not only impact your life, but others. God bless as you listen to God's Word. We are in a, a series called Pursuing the Path of Wisdom, and we've been working through uh, the book of Proverbs and, and looking at wisdom for our life. And what we've said over the course of this series is that uh, wisdom really comes within a relationship. Uh, we know we don't have all wisdom. We look for advice. We look for guidance. And generally, that wisdom and guidance is from someone that we trust, a relationship that we have. Sure, every once in a while, We'll go to Google or uh, the search engine that we have and look online. But generally, when we need advice and wisdom, who do we go to? We go to someone that we trust. And for the Christian, there's, uh, there's no one that we go to besides our Lord. That He is wisdom above all wisdom. In Him is all wisdom and understanding. And so wisdom comes from having a relationship with our Lord. And we've said that it's not a relationship based on fear. We're not scared of the Lord, but we trust Him and we love Him because He first loved us. His love for us that sent His one and only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins inspires our love and trust in Him. And it's because we know He loves us through Jesus that we're sitting, saying, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. We're ready to listen for wisdom for our life. In the last two weeks, we've looked at topics where it, it's, it's maybe easy to admit how we fall in these categories. So the first one we looked at was anger. It's, it's maybe easy to admit that there are times where we give in to anger, and anger shows up in our life, and why and how. Last week, we saw how easy it is to be mastered by money instead of mastering money. Those are, are, are two topics that are, are maybe easier to admit. But as I said, today's is a little harder. It's hard to admit when we're struggling with envy. Because as I said at, at the scripture reading, it just feels so petty. It feels so school-aged that I don't have what they have and I'm going to be upset about it. Uh, and yet, it's something that we all struggle with. Everyone in this room has been envious at some point in their life, and, and maybe you're envious right now. And so what we want to do today is we want to look at what envy does, we want to look at what the danger of envy is, and where do we take our envy? What envy does, what the danger of envy is, and where do we take our envious heart? To do that, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 23. Here's what King Solomon says around 950 B.C. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There's surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Do not let your heart envy sinners, Solomon says. Envy is that whole idea that they have what I want, and it's not fair that they get it and I don't. It's that idea that they have it, I don't, it's not fair. And not only is it not fair, but I get bitter towards them because they have it. We know what this is like. We, we, we have this feeling, don't we? It's not fair that she can fit into that dress at her age. It's not fair fair that he got the promotion that he didn't deserve, but I did. It's not fair that she can seem to juggle 
everything that life has to, uh, throws at her. Working, a mother, an involved parent at the school. It seems like her marriage is good. It's not fair that she can do that and I can't. It's not fair that he has the financial security to bring to his family that I wish I could provide. It's not fair that she has a family that I wish I had. It's not fair that they have X, Y, or Z, and we could keep going. We know what it's like to envy what they have, and it's not fair that they get it. And so what is it for you right now? What is your heart envying and saying, it's not fair? Solomon says, do not envy sinners. Do not envy sinners. Those who don't follow God, but have what you want. And maybe that's the toughest part for Christians. Is here we are following God, living for the Lord, and yet they have what we want and it's not fair. And if that feeling goes unchecked, what does envy do? It's your first point today. Envy robs us of joy. Look at Proverbs 14.30. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy rots the bones. When, we, when our hearts are envious, it robs us of all joy. It robs us of peace. It robs us of contentment. It robs us of any happiness that we can have for them and for what we have. We lose sight of everything that our God has given to us because we don't have that. And we've got a great example of this in Scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 21, King Ahab is the king of Israel. Uh, he's a wicked king, but he's the king of Israel. And as king of Israel, what does he have? Just about everything. Uh, anything that the king wants, he generally gets, except for one thing. Naboth's vineyard. Naboth was a neighbor to the palace of King Ahab, and he had a fantastic vineyard. And so King Ahab approaches Naboth, and he says, name your price. I don't care. You tell me what you want for the vineyard, and I'm willing to buy it from you. Pretty admirable. Uh, he's not trying to cheat him. He says, I'm willing to pay anything. However, the Lord forbids Naboth from selling it to King Ahab. And so Naboth says, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't sell it to you. How does King Ahab respond? Do you remember? We're told he becomes sullen. And he goes to his bedroom, he lays in his bed, and he refuses to eat. Because envy robs the life of joy. It rots the bones and robs us of all joy. I wish I, I would have remembered where I heard this and written it down, but I, I don't remember but someone said one time that envy, of all the seven, seven deadly sins, envy is the only one that offers no pleasure or satisfaction. Start working your way through it. Anger. It feels good to let anger vent, doesn't it? Lust. Well, that's pleasurable. Greed. It feels good to get more and more. Sloth. Who doesn't like to sit on the couch and watch uh, a few hours of TV and just binge? Pride. Who doesn't like the feeling of feeling good about yourself? Gluttony. Well, who doesn't like turkey covered in gravy, mashed potatoes covered in gravy, sweet potato pie, deviled eggs, a nice warm buttery roll, some stuffing, and then to wash it all down, give me the piece of warm apple pie or pumpkin pie, and we're going to call it good. There's pleasure in food, and it's satisfying. But not envy. Envy doesn't feel good. Envy brings no satisfaction, no joy. In fact, it robs us of it all, and it rots the bones. That's what envy does. And yet, envy is even more dangerous than that. 
And that's what we hear from a guy named Asaph, who wrote for us Psalm 73. Asaph tells his story in Psalm 73, and he says, Praise be to God, however, I almost slipped and fell. I almost turned from my God. And he says, why? Because I envied the wicked. And what was it about the wicked, the the ungodly, that, that he envied? He said, I look, and what do I see? They have great bodies, healthy bodies. They have success. They they wear pride as a necklace, and and people praise them for it. They're arrogant. They have everything that I want. They have a carefree life. They have no troubles, no worries. They're living the carefree life. And Asa said, that's not fair, because here I am following the Lord, and I have difficulties. And I have troubles. I don't have what they have, and it's not fair. Because I'm sacrificing for the Lord. I'm living for the Lord. And I don't get it. That's not fair. God, you owe me. And that's your second point. The danger of envy is that it leads me to think God owes me. God, I've been following you, sacrificing for you, and I'm not getting what the non-Christian has. How is that fair? It's not. It's not fair, God. You owe me. And if we start going down that line of thinking, envy can lead to bitterness not only against those people, but against God himself. And we can end up thinking, what's the point? What's the point in following God? If you're not going to give me what my heart wants and, and, and they have it, maybe it's better not to follow you, God. This is where Asaph was. Have you been there? Are you there? Maybe you're here today with just a little bit left, like Asaph, you're, you're about to fall because, God, you're not giving me what I want. Asaph says, as as he thinks about all this, he says, uh, as I think about all this, it troubles my heart that the wicked get what I want and it's not fair. And he says, it troubles my heart. Until when? He said, until I enter the sanctuary of my God. Where does Asaph take his envious heart? To worship. And that's your third point today. Worship is the cure for an envious heart. And that is because Asaph said when he enters the sanctuary, what is he reminded of? He's reminded of their end. Where are the ungodly, the wicked, the non-Christian going to end, and where do we end up? Their life, their good life will end, and it will end, the good times will end when their life ends. But Asa said, for you and me, we live on forever with our Lord. Asa said, when, when he entered into the temple, and he, he entered the sanctuary of God, when he entered worship, what was he reminded of? Just how far gone he was. Just how far gone we are. In fact, Asa said, when... when When I entered the sanctuary, I realized that I was a brute beast before you, Lord. That's what we're like, he said. When we have that envious heart because of sin in our heart, what are we like before our God? A brute beast, and we were goners, and God should have let us go. But instead of finding a God who let us go, he finds a God of love, God of mercy, God of grace, and a God of forgiveness. Instead of finding a God who says, you want to act like a brute beast? See you later. He finds a God who is always with him. Here's what he says in Psalm 73. He says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel 
and afterwards you take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He, he says, I am this brute beast, and yet, Lord, you, all, you are always with me. You never leave me. In fact, I would have fallen on my own, but you hold me by my right hand, and you will not let me go. You guide me in the councils, and then you will bring me into glory. If we were to go by ourselves, which God could have let happen, we would be goners, but the Lord doesn't let us fall. He holds us by, his, by our right hand, not letting us slip, but reminding us of the future glory that you and I have to look forward to. And he holds us, keeping us safe from the fall. But there's something even more. What did it take for God to hold on to your right hand? What did it take for God to reach out, grab your hand, and bring you into glory? It took letting go of his son Jesus' hand so that he could hold on to yours. When Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you see what's happening there? It's in that moment that God let go of Jesus' hand, turned his back on him so that he could grab you by your right hand so that you wouldn't go. So that you wouldn't be a goner forever. And he holds on tightly. And the amazing thing about our Savior is that he's the only one who lived perfectly, who earned God's love, who earned the Father's love and favor and yet when God let go of his hand and turned to hold on to yours, there was not an ounce of envy in his heart. God the Father took his perfect love that Jesus earned and he gave it to the wicked sinner, Stephen Aft. He gave it to the sinner, you. The love that your Savior earned, he gave to you and there wasn't even a little bit of envy in Jesus' heart because he lived perfectly for you. And when he died on the cross, God let him go so that he could hold on to you forever. But there's more. As wonderful as that is, there's more. Not only did he pay for your sins, not only does a father have eternal love for you, but God says, everything that your heart desires, everything that you could be possibly envy of in this world that other people have, you're going to have forever in heaven. Everything is going to be satisfied in your heart. Intelligence in this world will end. Beauty will end. People's figures will end. The, the ability to juggle all things will end. Everything in this world that we could possibly want is going to come to an end, but the future glory that you and I have through Jesus our Savior will never end. And when the Lord pulls you into that future glory, you will have the glorious body that you always want. You will have an eternal family that you've always wanted. You will have success like you've always wanted. You will have a, a position that you've always wanted. You will have the deep satisfaction of being at peace, knowing that you've juggled everything perfectly. You will have peace and security that no one in this world has, except for the Lord. You will have everything that your heart is desiring right now for eternity. It will be satisfied through the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus promises to you and to me that that future hope will never be cut off because the Lord has you by your right hand and he will not let go. This is where we come, this is what removes the envy from our heart as we come to worship because we remember who we were, we remember what we deserve and what we have through the Lord. 
And this is why Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 23, do not envy the wicked, but have zeal for the fear of the Lord, the awe and wonderment of our God. And if you want awe and wonderment for what our God has done for you and me and who our God is, just think of how he let go of his son's hand to hold on to yours forever. And that will inspire awe and wonderment and zeal. Do you know what's interesting? In, in Proverbs 23 there, uh, there's only one verb. Do not be uh, passionate or envious or jealous or zealous for the wicked, but for the fear of the Lord. Solomon doesn't say, don't be passionate. He says, just change what you're passionate about. Do not be passionate for what they have. Instead, be passionate for the fear of the Lord. And as we grow in the fear of the Lord, what's going to happen right now? We'll be filled with peace, with joy, contentment. We'll be filled with satisfaction for what our God has given to you and to me. And then you know what the irony is? Those people that we've spent so much time envying out there will eventually look at us and be envious of what we have. And they'll come to us and say, how do you have peace through what you're going through? How, how, how do you have satisfaction? How do you have joy in, in this world right now? And then we have the amazing privilege to say, come, let us go to the house of the Lord and worship him, and you'll see. May God be with you as you know that the God of this world has given you all things. He holds you by your right hand, and he's given you a future of glory, a future hope, and that hope will not be cut off. As we meditate on that, let's pray, asking God to remove all the envy that we could possibly have because of what he's done for us. Gracious Father in heaven, uh, you're a God of mercy, a God of grace, uh, a God who does not let us go. Uh, instead, you hold us by our right hand. We thank you that uh, in order to do that, you had to let go of our Savior Jesus' hand, your Son Jesus' hand, uh, so that we could be held on forever. We thank you for forgiving our sins at the cross, we thank you for opening eternal life for us, and we thank you for that future hope that will never be cut off. Uh, everything in this world will come to an end, uh, but our future hope in heaven will never end. Uh, we thank you for that. We know that when we enter into glory, the deepest desires of our hearts will be filled. And now, as we are zealous for the fear of the Lord, uh, and as we grow in you, we will experience deep satisfaction, deep peace, and deep joy, uh, even when we don't have what we want. We ask you to be with us, fill us with joy and contentment today. Let others see our joy and contentment uh, that we may lead them to you, the God who satisfies all desires for all time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening to this message today. It's my prayer that uh, it has changed your heart as you grew in the message of your Savior, Jesus. Again, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing We'd be grateful for that. God bless your day.